On page 117 of the National Geographic Picture Atlas of Our Universe, written by Roy A. Gallant in 1980, we find this statement. Maybe the Moon and the Earth were formed at the same time, out of the same gas and dust. The same elements are found on both. Calcium, aluminium, titanium, magnesium, silicon, oxygen, iron, but in far different proportions. The most significant element of all is oxygen. The same elements are found on the Earth and Moon in far different proportions. These differing proportions make moon rocks unique compared to earth rocks. Did Jera even realize what he just said? This one statement alone disqualifies everything else he says about moon rocks being the same as earth rocks. Gee, that's rich. First Webb alleges that I quoted from a children's book, and then he alleges that I cannot understand the information of a children's book. As for what Gallant means by far different proportions, being very aware of the strikingly similar chemical compositions between Earth rocks and Apollo samples, it was clear to me that the Earth and Moon share the same proportion of said elements, but each proportion is different to one another. Let me give you an illustration. Both the Earth and Moon have the same proportions of calcium, aluminium, titanium, magnesium, silicon, oxygen and iron, but do each of these seven elemental proportions make up exact sevenths of the Earth and Moon's bulk chemistry? Of course not. Their proportion of oxygen, for example, would be different to their proportion of silicon. Likewise, their identical contents of silicon is different in proportion to their identical contents of aluminium. You get the idea. You can go onto the JSC Curator's website Go to their Lunar Sample Compendium section and download the documentation for any Apollo sample. These PDF files will tell you the weight percentages of the major and trace elements of these rocks. And if you know the weight percentages for their terrestrial counterparts, you can make a comparison. I read through hundreds, and I mean hundreds of these reports. And having compared them to terrestrial basalts, such as the JSC-1 simulants, and the rocks that Mason and Melson compared, I can safely say that none of these elements are in far different proportions to those of their terrestrial counterparts. Further proof of such can be found in the surveyor data. As Casing pointed out, prior to the Apollo missions, NASA launched surveyors 5, 6 and 7. Although only surveyor 5 landed close to the Apollo 11 site, all three of these probes carried an onboard alpha particle backscatter device to perform an onboard soil analysis and then transmit the data back to the United States. And it just so happens that all seven elements that Gallant listed, as well as sodium, were reportedly detected by the surveyor. In the July 18th, 1969 printing of Science, released just two days before the Apollo 11 landing, Turkovich and his team at the University of Chicago compared the Surveyor 5 data with the average chemistry of terrestrial basalts and eucrites, which are basically basaltic meteorites. Looking at this graph, it is immediately obvious that the oxygen, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, calcium and iron are quite fairly commensurate in all three types of rock. The only elements that seem slightly different are titanium and sodium. But then again, Surveyor 6 registered lower levels of titanium and sodium that are more comparable to that of ocean basalts. And Surveyor 7 detected no titanium at all. So overall, judging by this data, I wouldn't exactly say that earth rocks and moon rocks have elements in far different proportions to one another. Each said element is in the same proportion on both worlds, but each proportion varies from element to element. For example, the oxygen of ocean basalts, moon rocks and eucrites is about the same, but it is evidently different to their same proportions of aluminium, magnesium, etc, etc. Webb has a nasty habit of not giving his audiences all the details, and then cherry-picking selected quotes that are open to interpretation, and then manipulating them into whatever interpretation suits his argument. 
judging by how his small minority of adoring fans have fallen blindly behind him, I'd say that demonstrates just how vast their alleged knowledge of lunar geology really is. Here's a thought. If all the elements on the moon are in far different proportions to the elements on the Earth, why state that they probably shared the same origin? One would think that different proportions of all the elements between the two would lead to the exact opposite conclusion. And he's telling me that I cannot understand the information of a children's book? Now some, such as Brian Mason and William Melson, have pointed out that the Surveyor 5 data can be matched fairly closely with the chemistry of Apollo 11 samples. In that sense, it could be argued that NASA knew what the lunar geology was like in advance. I have no doubt that NASA made an attempt to try and find out what the lunar geology was like in advance. That way, they would be able to get an idea as how to go about duplicating it. Nor do I have any doubt that the Surveyor probes landed on the moon. But what I question is whether the Surveyor data that NASA released to the public was legit or bogus. Why do I question this data? As we learned in Exhibit D, when Smart One scanned the lunar surface in 2006, it was able to detect calcium that was in agreement to that of the Russian samples, but never was there any such verification for the Apollo samples. Likewise, when Smart One crashed into the ground and kicked up plumes of moon dust that scientists could analyze using radio telescopes, it was discovered that the minerals were different to those in the Apollo samples. By punching a 10 metre hole in the moon's surface, the probe has uncovered minerals different to the rocks gathered on the surface during moonwalks. The key is the chemical signatures in the dust and debris thrown up by the collision. I suspect that NASA's surveyor probes detected similar chemical and mineralogical findings. And when it was discovered that the minerals and chemistry were vastly different to what we have available down here, NASA then substituted that data with numbers that were easier to duplicate. Hence, that's why the surveyor data indicates the moon rocks are pretty much the same as oceanic basalts and eucrites. And why would Jera think that oxygen is the most significant element in this list? Could it be that oxygen isotope ratios are the only isotope ratios that are identical between earth rocks and moon rocks? Apparently so, because this simple fact becomes the sole crux of the remainder of his moon rock assertions. Let's see, do I detect another argument based on a misrepresentation of an opponent's position? Yes, the identical oxygen isotopes in the Apollo samples and Earth rocks are one of the reasons why I consider oxygen to be the most important element found in these rocks. But there is another reason, which is explained immediately after the section that Webb shows. On page 117 of the National Geographic Picture Atlas of Our Universe, written by Roy A. Gallant in 1980, we find this statement. Maybe the Moon and the Earth were formed at the same time, out of the same gas and dust. The same elements are found on both. Calcium, aluminium, titanium, magnesium, silicon, oxygen, iron, but in far different proportions. The most significant element of all is oxygen. It is universally known that the Moon has no atmosphere. Therefore, it has no free oxygen. This means that any oxygen found in the lunar samples would have to be chemically combined with the other elements that these rocks are composed of. This is the very definition of the term oxidation. This will become important a bit later. And if you recall, the Apollo samples are primarily silicon dioxide and ferrous oxide, titanium oxide, aluminium oxide, calcium oxide, magnesium oxide, and the various other oxides all make up the rest of the Apollo sample's chemical composition. Obviously, you need oxygen to make these oxides. Therefore, you need oxygen to make up the chemistry and mineralogy of these samples. Weber conveniently neglected this. 
Now in my original video, one of my main interests in the oxygen of these samples is that exposure to oxygen causes oxidation. Later on in his series, Webb points out an error that I've made along these lines. He points out that the term oxidation generally refers to the presence of secondary oxides that form over the sample stay within the atmosphere. Whereas in my video, I only focused on the primary oxides that were there when the rocks first formed. Well, thank you for that clarification, Phil, and thanks for pointing out my mistake. But need I remind you that there are secondary oxides present in these samples. If you recall back to episode 1, we learned that various rocks do have hydrous iron oxides as a result of their water. Sample 66095 is a notorious example, as the rock is rusted inside and out. The Lunar Sample Compendium casts doubt on this being the result of terrestrial contamination. It is possible that anhydrous metal salts, chlorides, in 66095 combined with the moisture in the Lunar Module, Command Module, Tropical Pacific and or Individual Terrestrial Laboratory, yielding terrestrial-like hydrogen and oxygen isotopic signatures. However, it is difficult to see how moisture penetrated into the sample to rust the interior metal grains. Although numerous Apollo 16 rocks exhibit some rust around metallic iron grains, 66095 is unusual in that it has abundant evidence of alteration. Alteration is found in the interior as well as on the surface. In thin section, the thin gray margins to metallic iron grains indicates rusting in situ. The brown stain extends into the silicates surrounding the iron grains. It is difficult to believe that this is the result of terrestrial alteration. So yes, I'd say my two reasons for considering oxygen the most significant element in this list is quite valid. The oxygen isotope ratios are the same between Earth rocks and Apollo rocks, and it would have taken a long stay within the Earth's atmosphere to create these secondary oxides, such as the rust that has penetrated right through sample 66095 and rusted some of the metallic grains from other Apollo 16 samples. And it's not true that oxygen isotope ratios are the only isotope ratios that are the same between Earth rocks and Apollo samples. For example, the Moon Issue of Science carried this article by Epstein and Taylor, in which they clearly state, The bulk oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 and silicon 30 to silicon 28 ratios of these lunar rocks are identical with ratios of terrestrial basalts. More recently, Tobol and his team reported in the December 20, 2007 issue of Science that the identical tungsten 182 to tungsten 184 ratios of the lunar and terrestrial mantles require either that the moon is derived mainly from terrestrial material, or that tungsten isotopes in the moon and Earth's mantle equilibrated in the aftermath of the giant impact, as has been proposed to account for the identical oxygen isotope compositions of the Earth and moon. And we already saw how the deuterium is similar between Earth and Apollo waters. It is clear that either Webb's knowledge of Apollo samples is not as vast as he claims it is, or he has committed yet another fallacy of omission. This time, by ignoring the various non-oxygen isotope ratios, and then claiming that oxygen isotope ratios are the only isotope ratios identical in Earth rocks and Apollo samples. And whilst we're on the subject of omissions, Webb just had to finish his video with yet another omission.